Thank you, Dr. Narima, for enlightening speech and uh, for setting the tone for today's event, uh, highlighting some major issues and uh, discourses uh, in relation to today's topic. With this, I would like to pass the floor to our moderator uh, of today's roundtable discussion. Uh, Hassan, uh, back to you. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, our guest, Professor Ibrahim Musa, distinguished speakers, Professor Sheila, Professor Clive Kessler, Dr. Dr. Farouk Musa, Dr. Narima, and of course, our friends, ladies and gentlemen. So, the topic. Islamic global politics a civilizational crisis. Within its... Can you hear me? At the back, can? Okay. Within its first half of a century, Islam, under the leadership of the Prophet wasallam, and his early companions has spread religiously as well as politically from a small city-state in Arabia to vast lands in three continents with diverse multicultural population. This could have only been achieved through an unquestionable faith in God and strong sense of solidarity among the early generations of believers. Within a short duration of time, Islam and the Muslim Ummah had rapidly expanded and shaped its global feature that would rise into being one of the most influential civilizations in the world's history, which has remained as an inspiration and ideal of the global Muslim population. However, what would happen in the later centuries, despite its continuous expansion, Muslim communities had to deal with, with internal civil wars, inter-dynasties, contestations, and the foreign threats of colonization. In the more recent times, Muslim societies have all become officially independent nations with the capability to self-rule and determination. Still, what we can see today of Muslim societies we are still far away from the ideal as an exemplified by the earliest generation of Muslims. Muslim societies globally are divided into various nations, some in confrontation with one another, increasing sectarian division, while several countries being ruled under despotic authorita authoritarianism. Islam, which once has driven, a global has driven a global civilizational force, but now can be seen as causing a state of civilizational crisis. Could there be a cure to the problems faced by Muslim societies today? And would there be any hope that the Ummah could once again rise as a global force of civilization in the future? This is what the forum would like to explore. Uh, in fact, I would, like, I would also like to say that our session, our discussion today is actually the third session featuring Professor Ibrahim Musa. Our first session, which was on Friday evening, the last Friday evening, which Professor Ibrahim Musa talked about the madrasa, or mainly the essence of Islamic education. And yesterday we also had a session here, which our discussion was on Islamic reform. What more or less can be said from the past two sessions, despite the suggestion and proposition on education and Islamic reform, we could not really achieve the solution without, by, I mean, by ignoring the political problem that the Muslim civilization is facing. Thus, to uh, continue with our discussion, I would like to first introduce or describe more about our main speaker today, Professor Ibrahim Musa. He's a professor of history and Islamic studies at the University of Notre Dame. Ibrahim Musa, is, his interpretative and historical research on questions related to Islamic tradition, ethics, and laws include two monographs as well as several edited and co-edited books. His prize-winning book, Ghazali and the Poetic of Imagination, was awarded the best first book in the history of religions by the American Academy of Religion. And, is, and he's also the author of What is a Madrasa? Islam in the Modern World, Muslim Family Law in Sub-Saharan Africa, and quite a number of other works. He has also published influential essays on Islamic law, theology, as well as contemporary Muslim ethics, bioethics, biotechnology, and political thought. Professor Ibrahim Musa is also regarded as a prominent public intellectual. In 2007, he was invited to deliver the 2007 King Hassan Lecture to His Majesty King Muhammad VI of Morocco in Arabic. Without further delay, I would like to invite Professor Ibrahim Musa to deliver his talk. 
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. We thank and praise God and we send salutations to His Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم. Good afternoon, السلام عليكم. Thank you so much to the Islamic Renaissance Front, the IRF, to Professor Farouk, uh, to Dr. Farouk Musa for inviting me another time to Malaysia for the warm welcome that most of you have shared with me in a variety of ways. I want to thank Ms. Alma Barisha, my IRF, Madam Narim, uh, Narim, Narima Awiri, and Dr. Um, Rashila, uh, Rashi, uh, Rashila. Rashila Ramli and Professor Clive Kessler for joining us uh, today and also to our moderator, Ehsan Shawahid. Um, I, I, I couldn't write these things uh, very clearly, so apologize, uh, Dr. Rashila, um, uh, for, for not getting your name right the first time around. Um, <clears throat> I, you know, there's, you, you've been extremely generous, um, this audience here, and you've put a lot of pressure on me as if I know what I'm talking about. Um, these issues are as complicated and as complex as, as they come. And as a student of Islamic thought and as a student of, of religion, of theology, I try to, to make sense of the world in which we are living. And, and so I, um, I thought, what is the best way um, that I can share my thoughts with you today? In 2014, I was here at, um, at IRF, and um, Julia uh, did an interview with me uh, that was um, sent on, you know, put on the, on the website. <clears throat> so as some of you know that I'm from South Africa. I was born and raised there, spent six years studying theology at the Madrasa in India, then went into a career in journalism. Uh, in the UK, in South Africa, then back into South Africa, political activism within the Islamic for, within Islam, on the Islamic platform, and then into academia. So a young man who I know, going back um, when I was in the Islamic movement, and one of the people that I, I trained, has always been following me wherever I've, I've gone, and he asks me all kinds of questions, and sometimes he gets extremely angry with me. And um, he's always concerned that my location in the West might also skew my perspective of the world. I do have a kind of a, a liberal dimension to some of my, 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 my work. Um, I don't know why it is so criminal, but some people think that liberalism is criminal. I think there are varieties of ways of being liberal. Um, and and um, so obviously people, some people equate liberalism with liberal capitalism. Um, and there are some conversations to be had about that. But alternative solutions are also in short supply, except for a huge supply of anger, both on the left and also on the, on the part of a certain kind of uh, Muslim extremist groups and so on. Also, moderate Muslims are also fairly angry, and they're not sure where to go. So this young man last night uh, sent me, this morning, and I op opened my email, I saw this email, he made reference to that 2014 interview, and he said that, you know, he wants to make this observation. And the observation is that, you know, in that interview, I criticized Daesh, ISIS, and he's arguing and he's saying that, you know, that these foot soldiers of, of Daesh, who are the product of, and he said that, you know, that I describe as illiterate, yet, uh, literate, yet illiterate, um, and they are literate, yet illiterate because of an alim class, the ulama, the, the alim class, that is those people that teach them uh, what is religion from an orthodox perspective. Are they also not a product of the absence of a meaningful Islam that offers young, frustrated, de-dignified Muslims tools and answers to deal with the insults of an Islamophobic, rapacious, capitalistic world which severely prejudices Muslims blacks and all others, and in many cases, praise on them. I've read this out because I think people at the back, it's a terrible PowerPoint I made. You can't see it at the back, so hopefully you could, you could, you could, you could, you could read it. Um, and then he goes on, simply put, where is the credible alternative for a young, impatient, perhaps not educated, 
but highly connected. Keep that in mind, a highly connected, internet savvy, someone who can access, do things, get into your computer, highly connected and ill-informed Muslim. Not your kids or mine, but those languishing in the ghettos, suffering unemployment, oppressive regimes, and the daily assaults of the, w, of the WOT. I didn't know what WOT was, so my Google told me that WOT means um, World of Tanks. That's also a game, I believe. So I could be wrong. I'll have to write to him and explain to me what is WOT. But I think he, the world, the daily assaults of the World of Tanks, or maybe he means something else. Where mainstream Islam offers platitudes, keyword. Mainstream Islam offers platitudes and a program for the afterlife Yet the only program for this world, as crazy as that program is, is that of a maniacal, murderous jihadis. Okay, so before I get carried away, he said, here's the question. Is Daesh an extremist fundamentalist not also in a major way a product of the failure of orthodoxy to deal with the plight of the Muslim today? I ask because maybe I miss hearing that. This is this is the question on the hearts and minds of millions of Muslims around the world. I have friends, when attacks happen in London, um, on train stations or so, in, in Brussels and other places, these are highly educated European Muslims of a, uh, you know, their parents have come there two, three generations ago. When I talk to them and I ask them, look guys, you guys need to take back Islam, you need to organize a protest, you need to show outrage beyond just a statement. You need to go and take back Islam on the streets, organize something in Hyde Park or in the streets of Paris or in Belgium and other places. These very smart Muslims tell me that, you know, if we're going to do that, then we are just confirming, we're just confirming for the Islamophobes that Islam is the problem, if we are going to do that. And Whatever these people are doing, these ISIS people, that is not Islam. I said, it might not be Islam, it might be a pathology, but they're doing it in the name of Islam, in the name of Islam, and millions of people around the world are attributing that to Islam and until you are not going to say no to that, until you're not going to show the alternative to that, millions of people are going to say that is the real Islam because those people are doing it in the name of Islam. So you then have to agree to the fact that there are different kinds of Islam and some kinds of Islam that these people are claiming. See, I'm not in the business of declaring these people to be un-Islamic. That's a whole different kind of business, okay? And to declare them kafir. Declaring them kafir is not going to help. It, it hasn't, not a single out of declaring these people kafir has helped. To declare ISIS kafir or to call them the khawarij. These are all just names that we are just drawing out of desperation from the historical legacy to call them the Kharijites. What we need to understand is that we need to advocate that Islam is a moral teaching and what they're doing are immoral. So you can be Muslim and be a murderer and be a mass murderer. You don't have to deny that person the claim to being Muslim. He or she can still believe in God and all this kind of stuff, but be a mass murderer and be a criminal of, of a severe order. That's not incompatible. It might not be the best illustration of Islam. So stop this business of putting labels on people because soon they're going to put a label on you. They're going to call you liberal, they're going to call you leftist, they're going to call you modernist, and you're not going to have a conversation about the real issues. So you get, you get, you get lost into, into labeling and into name calling instead of getting to the real business of what is it that you're talking about? What are the facts? So. And, and unfortunately, my biggest concern is that evil flourishes when good people do nothing. And the good Muslims are doing zero. The good Muslims are not doing enough. I used to say <clears throat> when Pakistan used to have so many, so many bombs going off and suicide bombings happening and so on, I used to say, that you know, where are, the, where are the good Pakistanis? If my country is under so much siege by crazies, we should be protesting on rollerblades. You should be on your rollerblades all day protesting. Well, I apologize to Pakistanis now. This now applies to many other places in the world, not only to Pakistan. 
This issue has now gone so viral that on a daily basis in Kabul, bomb, suicide bombings are going off in different parts of Iraq and Syria and so on and so forth. It's just horrific. And on the other hand, you're having an international alliance that is just, you know, in, in order to end ISIS's reign, are also killing thousands of civilians. So righting the wrong is also creating more wrongs. And people are being mobilized by that. And so we don't have good solutions. By solving the problem, we're also creating more problems. And, and, and not doing anything to ISIS is also not the solution. So it's an it's extremely complicated issue, and we have to listen to all sides of the story. And therefore, I have to listen to this young man who wrote to me. And he's absolutely right. He's absolutely right that the, if you think of ISIS, all the muftis in different parts of the world who are giving ridiculous interpretations of Islam, you have your laundromat muftis um, uh, and, and, and those kind of stuff. These are a product of us. They don't, these people have not come from Mars. These are your brothers and sisters, your uncles and your aunts. These are part of your, your community. And this idea of just you know, throwing our hands up in surrender, I got nothing to do with that, that's also not the solution. So we need to make sure that, you know, that we, we diagnose the situation correctly and we feel the sense of responsibility. In the question of the question of responsibility, the Prophet salam, was once asked by a Bedouin who came into the mosque. And the Prophet was giving a sermon. And the Bedouin said, you know, the Bedouins had a different kind of attitude. They're not urban people. They came from outside. They didn't have the finesse and didn't know exactly when to ask a question. The Prophet was still talking and he said, Ya Muhammad, mata sa'a? Oh Muhammad, tell us, tell me, when is the hour of judgment? The Prophet ignored him, was completely, completed his conversation. The, the Bedouin asked twice, and on, the, on uh, uh, at least thrice he asked, when the Prophet finished his sermon, he asked him, Where's the one who asked about the Day of Judgment? And then he says, Here I am. So the Prophet said, You asked about the Day of Judgment? He said, Yes. Now look at the answer he gave them. He said, That when amana, when trust, is destroyed, expect the hour of judgment. This man is asking about the apocalypse. He's asking when the world is going to end. The prophet gives him what we would today call a moral and philosophical answer. That your society, your community disintegrates if you lose trust. If you don't trust each other. If you don't have the fundamental values of giving your money to somebody and knows it will be safe. If you don't know, if you can't trust that the government that takes your money uses your money responsibly and doesn't give it to their cronies. You know, when, you don't, when you have money and, and the money is not used to serve you, but rather line the pockets of the rulers. And this is not, I'm sure this doesn't happen in Malaysia, but it happens in many other parts of the world. I mean, you are lucky that it doesn't happen here. Uh, but it happens in, in many, many countries of the world. Uh, you know, I have to come back to Malaysia, so I, I you know, uh, uh, I, I, cannot be, I cannot be so brazen and, and disrespectful. But you know, you know, you know, your, you know, as the people, as the Arabic saying says, "Ahlu Makkah adra bi The people of Mecca knows his alleyway, alleys, and byways. So you know what I'm talking about. Um, but I don't want Jakim to put me on the blacklist. Um, or, 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 or what's the name? Because I think I need to have this conversation with more people other than IRF, and I hope that I, I, I can learn more uh, from your context. But the Prophet was not done with this Bedouin. This Bedouin said, you said, you said now that when trust is lost, there's going to be a day of judgment. So he says, okay, now tell me, how does this happen? How does Trust get destroyed. He said, 
and he gave he gives this amazing answer إذا وصل الأمر إلى غير أهله فانتظروا الساعة then when matters are given to those who are not competent expect the hour so it's both trust mean to be a trustworthy person you must be competent you, you, you can't be a fool you can't be an idiot that people are going to swindle you out of the money you must capacity and talent you must have abilities so trust comes first but once you're a person of trust you also know that you're going to find knowledge that are trustworthy you're going to find sources of trustworthiness you're going to do things on the basis of ex of experience and what is right and what is wrong and you're going to do things in a way that accomplishes the greatest good and therefore I think that we need to when we think about this question of the crisis of civilization and we talk about Islamic politics the diagnosis is fairly straightforward that how do we get competent people into to govern us and if they are not competent they must have a, an array of, of resources to draw upon to make it possible. One cannot have this also if you don't have good levels of education in your country. Because if you are not going to have good levels of education in your country, you're going to be dependent on, on international corporates who are going to give you, you know, uh, advice of how to run your country. They come with their own agendas, they connect it to global networks, um, uh, uh, forms of market that they want to, they want to supply. You're going to be advised by foreigners uh, because you don't trust your own people uh, and they give you the wrong advice, they misread the culture and the litany continues, the litany continues. You can see this now from what's going on in Saudi Arabia and the war in Yemen and the conflict with Iran and what people in the UAE and other places are doing, the kind of strategies they're putting into place to combat violent extremism and they completely misdiagnosing the situation. Some very, very good people whom I respect have been drawn into this and holding conferences in very, very expensive hotels and not delivering and not having a diagnosis that, that seems sensible. So, of course, violent extremism is the problem. But what is the cause of violent extremism? What is the diagnosis for that? And the very people who ought to know better are not diagnosing it. And so, I want to argue that the issues in majority of Muslim societies, the question of the, question of the underdevelopment. See, I, 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 yesterday I talked about what I think should be, how we should be thinking about the religious thought in a more comprehensive way. I talked about that. If you have any questions about that, I can repeat it. Uh, for those of you who weren't here yesterday, I'll be happy to do so, but I see many of the same faces here today, so I don't want to make you think that I only know one thing. I, I knew at least two. Uh, and the other thing is, is that, you know, you might be, you know, I have expectation, I want to engage with you, but I can repeat some of the stuff. Under development of Muslim majority societies. What are these statistics, right? I mean, from illiteracy, I mean, I was not aware until I was in Pakistan uh, a week ago. I told you, Pakistan, literacy is, illiteracy is hovering at over 40 percent. I was surprised. Absolutely surprised. In South India, and you can see the effects, in South India, in the states of Kerala, there's 100 percent literacy. Now, it doesn't mean that there are not frustrated Muslims out there and they're doing crazy things. There are a few. But generally, you look at the pattern of Islam in places like Kerala, it is fairly, fairly decent. People have fairly stable lives. There's Sheikh Abu Bakr, who is a kind of a, a Sufi and teacher. He's got tons of thousands of students, many of them write to me, and they're doing good work. They, they're uplifting their society. They're not waiting for a handout. So we need to stop being a handout community and do something for ourselves. And, um, and, and the question is, the other question is the, the deficit of dignity. The deficit of dignity, even despite the wealth. I mean, the richest Muslim at a particular time, Osama bin Laden, who had millions in his bank account, experienced a deficit of dignity. And he went to go and do the craziest things that, that one could, what was name? In the same way that that correspondent for me in South Africa said, you know, what other alternative is there because these people see nothing else but this cra crazy murderous jihadis. 
and bin Laden became a murderous jihadi. And stop praying for him and saying he's a big, he's a shaheed, or that, you know, people like, uh, what's the name, the man who killed tens of thousands of, of, of his own people, uh, what's the name, Saddam Hussein, and feel sorry for them. That is exactly our moral irrationality. It's not even irrationality. It's the opposite of moral. That's the immor immoral thinking. That is immoral thinking. And if we can't call a spade a spade, then we shouldn't be in this business. We should not be in this business of thinking, you know, do something else. The absence of human development. You, we, we need a, a, a thou, tens of thousands of people like Muhammad Yunus, or people like Abdul Sattar Edi, the Edi Foundation. This man started in Pakistan in doing ambulance services. It's become a global, a global you know, institution for doing aid and helping and rescuing people and so on. This man, um, Muhammad Yunus, no matter what you think, and people say, you know, the Grameen Bank that he's done, he, of course there are going to be mistakes that he's going to make. But the ability to deliver small amounts of capital to people, especially women, to uplift them and to have human dignity and own it, for God's sake. This is totally out of the sunnah. A man comes to the Prophet, he's begging, the Prophet tells him, do you have, do you have anything? He says, yeah, I have a, I have a, I have a pot or a pan. He said, go and sell the pot, of a pot and a pan, go and buy a, a piece of metal that we can turn into an axe. And then the Prophet helps this man and puts in a, a, a handle into this axe and says, now you go out and go, go do something with this and then you earn. The, prof, the Prophet says on the day of judgment that those who beg will, will, be, will be raised with no flesh in their face. Now this is metaphorical, obviously. What it means that you have, you, those who have, are responsible for making people beg. And you have robbed them of their dignity. We have robbed them of their dignity. We have not given them food, we have not given them shelter. We are collectively responsible for that. So this, this deficit of dignity goes deep into Islamic culture. Oftentimes we misunderstand dignity as that being of honor. That is one form of dignity. But the real form of dignity is human well-being. And that all of us have to have well-being and not only some. And if the lowest of us is at the state of well-being, then all of us flourish, not only a few. And the other thing is, is that in today's world, in a globalized world, you, we as Muslim societies will not, cannot enter the state unless you've got something to offer. You have something to offer that no one else, no one else has. We have tremendous amount of resources in our, in our tradition, from the political to the moral that talks about the care of human beings, how to care for human beings, how to make, how to make worlds possible. This faith tradition starts in a very underdeveloped place called Arabia in the 7th century, but under the impetus of a man with a mission inspired by God, develops a global civilization that alters and creates civilization. And what is civilization? That one, a human of human social development. That is what civilization means. Um, and, and developing a certain kind of organization that makes human flourishing possible, where civility prevails, where civility prevails, where there's no want, where people are cared for, where there's no, vi no hunger, no, no disease, no, no, no things that are at least human-made things, right? Um, some things are done by nature um, that we get afflicted by famine or by, you know, typhoons and other things and so on that we, have, we, are, we, that we don't have resources to combat. But other ways also we have signs that helps us to predict when we're going to, what, what we're doing to the environment, when we're going to have famines, when we're going to have droughts, and we can, we can help, uh, you know, ourselves against that, about, you know, uh, vaccinating ourselves. So knowledge and those kind of things are part of our, of, of our, of our tradition uh, that makes the world a better place. And so this is the, uh, you, ha you have to think intelligently, creatively, you have to think outside the box, to think about how are we going to make 
a difference to the world. And this is the key issue that education and yesterday's panel, we came to education. Education is critical. I said yesterday, you know, we have many Muslims where they go to Islamic schools, public schools, they can memorize stuff. They can do things, they can enter into the world stakes, get a degree from American or European university and come back home. No creativity. Whereas the kid who goes to the third class university within your country thinks outside the box and produces something. I mean, there's a great story in the New York Times. A couple of years ago, I've kept it, I'm going to use it in a book. Of a guy somewhere in Hyderabad or somewhere who saw his, his wife having huge amounts of kind of difficulty when it came to her, to her monthly menstrual menstruation. And they're poor, they don't know, they can't afford sanitary pads. And this man thinks outside the box and uses cotton and creates cheap sanitary pads. That you can have dignity. That you can have, a woman can have dignity, that his wife can have dignity creating something, you think outside the box. Whereas if you memorize all the formulas and you get the best degrees and you go to the best university and you just become another you know, cog in the wheel but not thinking. So education must be creative. So the way to combat underdevelopment is to create human, per, human beings who are capable and capable human beings are not going to be people that do the, thing, do the same thing over and over and look at these, you know, all these books that are being sold, you know, one of the things that some of my friends tell me that you come to Malaysia, I said, where can I have a good bookshop? I said, don't worry, you're just going to get all the self-help manuals are going to tell you, you know, how to become a rich person, how to do this and how to do computers. But you're not going to have provocative books on the bookshelves here that is going to make you think and critical inquiry. So development of, under, to combat underdevelopment, education is a cru crucial thing. And education that, that leads to civility and civilization, that begins there. It's about the human soul. Education is about the formation of the person. It's about developing virtue, uh, virtuous individuals. But virtuous individuals doesn't mean you are a stupid individual. We often think that the person who's quiet, doesn't ask questions, is a good person. No. There could be some deficits that you have not identified. Um, a virtuous person is someone who asks questions, who engages, who learns, who has curiosity. And if your educational system does not create curiosity, it's a flaw in the educational system. And this curiosity then has to lead to human beings' growth and creative thinking. Because in this world which we are living, it's just not about replicating, but getting for developing countries to get to the next level of the arc of, of technological and scientific and developmental change, you need to be on the cusp of what is going to be the next generation of, of, de of development and technological and scientific things. And this doesn't have to mean billions of dollars. It requires a mass of people to think creatively. What is it going to be? We are facing environmental challenges. We've got all kinds of challenges, energy challenges and so on, which doesn't mean that we have to have, you know, corn and those kind of things and turn that into an energy, but there could be solar, there could be all kinds of other possibilities that we even not thought of, but it's going to be that Malaysian or a person from Indonesia or from this part of the world who thinks about it, whose teacher inspired him or her and loved them and cared for them and teaching them. The love for teaching, the love to care for the, for the individual in your classroom and so on, that's where civility begins. By the time he or she becomes the prime minister, you can't teach him or her civility. But civility begins by, by talking about the question of what is critical uh, for human beings. And in my diagnosis is the absence of imagination and what Ali Alabi calls the spir spirituality of the imagination. Ali Alabi's book, you know, these, uh, on, on the, the crisis of, of Islamic civilization, absolutely crit critical book to read. Um, because I think he diagnoses the issues and the absence of a political imagination. And unfortunately, we think, and for, the good, for a good part, different parts of the Muslim world, we've experimented with certain kinds of political Islam and believing that the application of Sharia is going to create a magical solution. 
And I know you had your own challenges with, uh, you know, states in Malaysia who want to apply Sharia and Hudud and all this kind of stuff. And I'm not sure, and you might, and some might, might inform me better, but has the GDP and income of people in that area gone up? Has there been, has there been any betterment in the human condition? Um, maybe we could, that, that's, that's, that's a useful conversation to have. Um, what, we, what we fail to understand that Sharia and Deen is about how to optimize the human good. That is what Deen is. To optimize the human good, I can cite you scholarly authority, a man by the name of, you know, wrote the major dictionary, um, uh, Al Kafawi, writes that Deen is what on ilahiyun saiqun dawil uqul bi ikhtiyarim al mahmud ila al khairi bi that. That the deen, the meaning of deen and the word deen and sharia are often used interchangeably. That deen means a kind of a divine, posit, divinely posited order that takes intelligent, rational individuals, with, take them in terms of their good choices that they make to optimize the good, to optimize the common good. That is a 15th, 16th century Islamic thinker. And very few people disagree with it. That's the essence of, of what we call Sharia and Deen. And we need to understand that these rules and regulations that were made historically come from within the particular historical context. And they work their way out. And in the interview I did with Julia, I tried to elaborate some of the stuff. that Maybe you can watch that, that, that video again of 2014, where I talk about the, uh, the, these, these rules and regulations and how they develop. And therefore, today, we have Maqasid the Sharia helping Muslims to think about the big picture of stuff. That Sharia has a big picture vision, and oftentimes we get lost in the laundromat. This is, I, someone should be writing a book, losing oneself in the laundromat. Okay? This laundromat Islam. Or this idea that many, many Muslims don't want to learn modern knowledge, and especially religious people, they say, you know, modern knowledge is going to create us this modern knowledge is going to create a situation in which we are going to lose our identity. And one important scholar, who I won't mention name, uh, but if you read my book, What is a Madrasa, you will see that. This scholar says, well, you know, we cannot introduce young Muslims to modern knowledge because this modern knowledge is going to create doubt in their minds. And therefore, a few ulama should study this and this modern knowledge and then, and then, and then cleanse it and give the clean part of it to young Muslim theologians. And I said, dude, I didn't say that in the book, but, 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 I, but, I, but I said, my dear respected sir, you think that knowledge is something that you can take to the laundromat. Exactly. There's an obsession about this kind of thing that you can wash things clean. The only way that things can be washed clean if you have a great intelligence. And the solution you're providing is not an intelligent one. They, that scholar ought to know that Ghazali said that the one who doesn't doubt really doesn't truly believe. That you have to doubt, you have to question, you have to interrogate. There's the last lines of Ghazali in his book, Mizan al-Amal. Go and look at the book. Last lines, he says, you have to ask questions. And so the educational issues are absolutely crucial. Religion is one component of civilizational things. And Muslim civilization is important, and its hallmark is that it takes the transcendent very seriously. But when the transcendent is reduced to the power machinations of a few and turned into an apparatus of power and authority to declare things halal and haram, that's where you lose the transcendent. That's when you become totally materialistic and the loss of spiritual imagination. I said yesterday, I'm going to repeat it today, that at the level of political imagination, we have not invested anything. The Iranian revolution came and gone and might be going through its own, you know, um, uh, challenges right now, and it went through several years ago. But it's about authoritarianism right at the top. Authoritarianism and nothing else. Comparatively, Iran is doing better than Saudi Arabia. Right? Comparative is better. It has got a, a certain amount of freedom. But is that, is that the yardstick? Is Saudi Arabia now going to be the yardstick of development that we think that Iran is better? 
Iran should have been better than everyone else, given that it believed that it had a revolution and an inspiration from the divine. And it was trying to order. But the lack of imagination. They went back to an old idea, and we, we, we have to, as much as we, we, we think that Khomeini did a good thing overthrowing the Shah, he just put another Shah into power with religious credentials. And, you know, pulled out this idea of Wilayat al Faqih, governance of the jurists, that was a, a, an idea of somebody in the 18th century and retooled it and refigured it to do, do the power. Now, we're not entirely sure what political system works. Does, do Muslim societies want democracy, liberal democracy, socialism, and so on and so forth? But that's a conversation that Muslims should have, and they should be experimenting with different kinds of things to make sure that they can optimize their resources, they can you know, flourish, you know, satisfy their, their, their citizens, and flourish in a world in which there is uh, interconnectivity and interdependence that we have on a global scale. And, be, and make yourself indispensable in terms of the goods that you provide or the one thing that you provide. Indispensable. You have to, every nation today has to become an ind indispensable nation. It has to optimize its people's resources. It has to optimize its intelligence. It has to optimize the moral values of that society to get somewhere. And so the, 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 the question of the political imagination is absolutely what's name. The Muslim Brotherhood experimented in Jordan and in Morocco and, and, and in, 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 in the Sudan. And yesterday I heard that when Mursi uh, won the election, the Sudanese Muslim Brotherhood told them, don't do the mistakes that we did. Don't take power. You don't have the solutions to this. We didn't have the solutions. We thought we had the magic wand called Sharia. We could not, we could not eradicate poverty. And he went and, and he scared the people with, with his rhetoric. And then you had, not justifying Abdul Fattah Sisi's uh, you know, uh, coup, which is absolutely illegitimate, uh, and, 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 and the world should be ashamed for supporting him, but Saudi Arabia and the UAE are supporting these people uh, because the Saudi Arabia and the UAE do not foresee an Islam that is compatible with democracy. They want an Islam that is compat compatible to monarchy, and a successful Egypt would mean that there's an alternative that is possible. I don't know how long Tunisia is going to last. Uh, and, you know, one hopes that Tunisians pull it together, but Tunisia also has a very wise person at the spiritual uh, leadership in the form of Rashid Ghanoushi, who immediately makes concessions when he see, you know, on, on, you know, challenges on the road. He also uh, understands that you cannot introduce Sharia and the problems are beyond Sharia. His number two man told me that the biggest challenge we have is corruption. And we had, don't have, we don't have a solution to corruption. The society is rotten. How do you remake society? This is a huge challenge to remake society. So, and, 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 and make human beings understand that you cannot just take illegally, illicitly, in terms of you know, what you have been given um, in terms of resources. And yet the state of ship, sorry, the ship of state needs to move on. There's no way that you can take your country into a dry docks and fix it. A country is not like a ship that you can take to a dry docks and fix it and then send it on sea. You have to fix this boat on sea. And so it is a, it's immensely challenging. And we have to think about, and that's what I'm saying, we need to think about incremental changes, small amount of changes, small amount of changes, as they say, you know, environmentally, a butterfly, a butterfly that, that flaps his wings in Malaysia creates a typhoon. In the, Indian, in, in the Atlantic Ocean. Because changes are ecological. So a small change now can result in huge transformation over time. So change and thinking should be ecological and ch transformation is also ecological. Not eco-friendly, but ecological, that these things are, these are sensitive human systems we are working with. So our political systems, we should think of incremental changes, make it better. Don't, don't you know, reject something that looks good and can have useful outcomes. It might not be 100%. 50% is good enough. 60% is good enough. Because this kind of hyper-idealism that some of the people are having is exactly this hyper-idealism of, of Sharia states and, and all kinds of experiments with leftism, etc., that results in, in, in people being overthrown 
or people becoming dissatisfied. And international powers will hate you, take an opportunity uh, to, to, to capitalize. So the reduction, uh, we need to think about these issues and so on. And the spirituality of the imagination. Spirituality of the imagination is today that we are so obsessed with fiqh and Islamic law that, a, that this Islamic law that comes from a particular world order at a particular time, what I call empire, that I will explain in a minute, that we are so obsessed with that that we implement it and resulting in huge dis bringing Muslims and their thinking and their civilization into disrepute. This laundromat story was in the New York Times and several newspapers. Millions of people read it. And this isn't the first time. There are such embarrassing stories coming out of Egypt. You know, some Sheikh of Al-Azhar saying something ridiculous. It's too shameful to even mention here. Um, uh, you know, not, not, not the Sheikh Al-Azhar, but Sheikh from Al-Azhar who teaches there, says ridiculous things, published on the front page of the New York Times. And this is deeply embarrassing. Now then these young Muslims get angry. Oh, see, they're mocking fun. But it's your own people are doing the stupidity. So who are you blaming? The newspaper? They're only the messengers. Or they might have an agenda. They want to put Islam into dispute. Fine. What is your agenda? Anger. Frustration. You don't have a solution. You, don't, you are not thinking critically. And the only thing we wrap ourselves up into is into all kinds of identity projects. You want to look Muslim. You don't want to do Muslim, you just want to look Muslim. Looking Muslim is very different from doing Muslim. Doing Muslim is about making a change in the world. So this lack, the spirituality of the imagination and the absence of that is deeply, deeply troubling. Deeply troubling and that we cannot think about these issues creatively and constantly talking about the secular and the religious and religious and the secular and Sharia not understanding the big picture of things about, about the good. Someone who identified, and you should be reading this book. Now, there's something very interesting happening. Sorry, just what's the name? Yesterday, this place was like an Arctic. Today, it is turning into a furnace. <laughs> I mean, is there no way that, the, that we can adjust the, the temperature to 22? It's now becoming a furnace, and half my audience are falling asleep. Um, um, I mean, I, I'm trying my best to keep you awake. But the temperature is going to kill, is going to kill you. Um, so here's the thing. Um, maybe someone, maybe they didn't understand me. Can someone tell them to, to, to switch on the, the air conditioning, but not at, you know, minus five? Um, OK. Um, so Abdurrahman Kawakibi, the man who dies in 1902 at a very young age, um, he wrote this important book and which he diagnosed the problems of despotism. And the reason despotism succeeds because the regimes take control of your knowledge and the educational system. And then learning is replaced by ignorance. This doesn't only happen at the universities, this also happens in our madrasas and in our Islamic universities. And we need to own up to that. And therefore, Kawakibi talked about the need for a cultural revolution in order to undo that. Therefore, governments and authorities like people who are unquestioning. Anybody who asks questions is not going to be asked to become a, an advisor because they're going to give you troubling advice. And they're going to say things that you don't want to hear. Now, obviously, those of us who want to make, want, who want us to be heard, we must, Muslim progressives and the Renaissance folks and so on, must also be cautious that we do not, do not overreach. Your advice must also be palatable. Your advice must also be sensible. Right? So you must have a, a, re, a realistic agenda. Not to say things that are that are, that are so ridiculous. So a cultural revolution that you're thinking about, I'm increasingly becoming more, more skeptical about the revolutions um, because often these revolutions just repeat the very thing that they try to replace. It's romantic. It was good when I was 19 years old. I don't think it's good when I'm 60. Um, um, uh, and and I, I still need to see a, 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 a revolution and, you know, I mean, in many ways, I mean, 
there were all horrors happened, but the French Revolution did take France on a certain path. The American Revolution did on a certain path. Not always ideal. Cuba, uh, the revolution there, Latin America, other places. But you know, some of these things have just not been able to develop their potential fully. So you know, we have to think about this issue and you know, and stop being being uh, being so kind of romantic about these issues. And and we have to have the freedom to discuss this and to talk about that, even if everybody doesn't agree. And so the question of freedom in the in the in the modern world the huge cosmological shift that has happened. There's been a shift, cosmological shift. A cosmological shift that, that, that not only applies to science, but also about the human imagination at the level of the theological, at the level of philosophical. There is a God, air condition came back. Um, so, you know, you know uh, it, 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 there's a complete kind of, the cosmological changes that take place. And with the result that human beings begin to understand themselves in a different way. And we begin to think of ourselves as individuals in a way that our ancestors did not think of themselves in that way. And for that human experience that comes out of Europe, we begin to think about the question of freedom. And this now becomes a, a, a characteristic of human societies. Large, by and large, there are isolated instances of that sort. The question of freedom. And these kind of political and economic and scientific systems work on some of these principles. So someone like Kawakibi thinks of freedom as important. Now, unless there are some people who disagree with freedom, you know, I mean, this conversation might not go too much and not be too satisfactory. But I, it's also the idea of freedom was also that we no longer enslave human beings in, in, in slavery and bondage, right? Now, obviously, many, some of you are going to immediately say, but there are other forms of economic bondage. Yes, but that kind of slavery, except for the exception that ISIS took people, prisoners of war, slaves, that doesn't happen anymore. Or that major powers can completely isolate countries and enslave them. That's also happening. But it's not that kind of slavery they're talking about. It's a different kind of slavery, and we need to discuss it and talk about it and so on. And therefore, Kawakibi said um, that you know, it's the role of religion. Religion has that power. And in this way, Kawakibi is very much like Antonio Gramsci, um, the, the, the Italian uh, Marxist, uh, neo-Marxist thinker, who talked about the idea that, you know, you have, to, it's the advancing the ethical and moral struggle that by with, with which you can confront authoritarianism. And this authoritarianism is not something new that Kawakibi is saying. His kind of indirect mentor, Afghani, already talked about that in the 19th century. The problem that Muslims have is internal authoritarianism and external oppression, ex external colonization. So it's the same issue, authoritarianism. Now, of course, post-independent Muslim society is, uh, Muslim majority societies have got, gotten rid of some forms of authoritarianism, but there are still other forms of authoritarianism that still uh, prevail, and they have their thing. And therefore, he argues that the religion, uh, the moral command, is nasiha. Nasiha means the moral command. That we are, the Prophet asks, adinu nasiha. What is deen? Deen is not advice. Nasiha here means the moral command. What is the good thing that you have to do? So I told you the definition of deen is to optimize the good. And when the Prophet says adinu nasiha, he means that deen is about optimizing, giving you advice to how to, how to accomplish the moral good. Um, and in particular, um, Kawakibi was harsh on intellectuals who become slavish and do not ask the questions. And he, he, he mocked those bookish intellectuals who just want to be obsessed with the books. Um, and he said, you know, they were scholars, uh, as he said, um, who stored up in their heads vast amounts of information as if they were padlock libraries. And he mocks them and he says, the despot does indeed tremble at scholars who are the carriers of knowledge of life. You must be a carrier of knowledge of life. And in his words, such as philosophy, such as the rights of nations, the nature of society, and the question of governments, history and rhetoric, that kind of knowledge that makes things possible, that's it. That's what the despots fear. And I do believe that one of the big reasons for 
lack of development in Muslim majority societies has been the failure of, 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 of what's the name, of, of knowledge and education. And we've come up with cockamamie ideas of Islamization of knowledge and all this kind of stuff that really has sapped the, the energies and not delivered knowledge and created more kinds of identitarian, you know, fake identitarian projects, fake completely fake identity and we need to call it it's fake knowledge is knowledge and and as a, a colleague recently told me al ilmu la deen lahu knowledge has no religion knowledge is as the hadith says al hikmatu dalatul mu'min fam aina ma wajaduha fa haqqu biha that knowledge is the and wisdom is the lost treasure of the believer wherever he or she finds it they are the most entitled to it this idea of making knowledge part of identitarian project no that's missing out it's your understanding of the transcendent that makes you different and that's how you 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 know you deal with the question of the divine and the transcendent as to whom you give accountability and so I'm, I, time is limited i'm going to move on and so our, our biggest problem is what i call the theology of empire the theology of empire which is still very much current in all muslim religious thinking that muslims and islam are top dog and everybody else is at the bottom. Now this might have been possible when you had Islam as empire, you could have ideas such as la yuqtal al-mu'minu bil kafiri that the believer should not be killed for killing an, you know, a, a non-believer and that's what is still in the fiqh. A whole bunch of uh, 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 questions that are going on of Islamic law that is still crafted in that idiom of Islamic uh, you know, theology of empire um, in which it is hierarchical, distinguishing between the free Muslim and the free woman, and the woman below the free, uh, uh, the free man, and then, uh, then, then children and slaves, and then non-Muslims below that, and so on. That is a whole different world. And as I said yesterday, we do not condemn the people of the past. We need to believe in something that, the, we, that we are different without negation. That is their world. That is their world, and they live their world. And as the Quran says, Tilka ummatun qad khalat laha ma kasabat wa lakum ma kasabtum. These are communities, they have earned what they have earned. And for you, what you would earn. We cannot build a future on, on borrowed earnings from other people. We need to have a future that is built on our, our, our earnings, and you only earn your earnings in the way that I try to present here on the basis of creativity, humanity, and compassion. And so, therefore, the laundromat and all these kind of stuff, and, and, and let me not forget that the reason why extremist groups target such things such as enslaving prisoners of war or targeting blasphemy, it, because these are the questions that Muslim orthodoxy, the ulama have yet not sorted out. It's still in the back of their memories, and they still advocate that in one way or the other in one way or the other. This is shameless. They will not advertise it, but they still hold to these positions of executing blasphemers. And, and, and other thing is that generally Muslim Orthodoxy do not accept, by and large, except for a few, the political order that is prevalent. The political order is seen as illegitimate. So whatever way they, and, and countries like Pakistan is worse than say Malaysia. But the one great thing that you can learn from Nahdlatul Ulama, NU, is that NU has accepted the idea of a secular state as an Islamic, as an Islamic idea. That it is compatible with Muslim aspirations for how the political, so you can change it and alter it and through consent and so on and so forth. But that, and, and so what is so troubling is that the recent, you know, last year's uh, elections in Jakarta that showed that, you know, Indonesia that we thought was kind of a much more kind of embracing society of plural views and so on and so forth, that a certain kind of very dangerous Islamism emerged and showed its face. And hopefully those kind of forces can be defeated because that is going to ultimately destroy Indonesia. And we know that. We've seen too many others. I mean, Hassan al-Turabi experimented with one version of Islamism to the second version of Islamism, ultimately ending up in Sudan, a very, very unhappy person, then giving all kinds of liberalizing fatwas on on non-Muslim Muslim women marrying non-Muslim men and all kinds of stuff and so on, as if that is going to be a solution, right? But politically, completely bankrupt, completely bankrupt, and, and Sudan is bankrupted. Today, Sudan has asked to make a deal with the United States and through Saudi Arabia that, it can, that, the, that the sanctions are lifted against it, okay? So this is where you, where you end up 
when you squander your opportunities. And life and history does not give you second chances. And if you do not optimize it, and if you don't act responsibility, the crisis of Islamic civilization, as Ali Allawi said it, it could be the last chance that Muslims have. This could be the last chance. No prediction, I'm not Nostradamus. Many people think I come from Notre Dame, and some people, they say, Notre Dame. I said, no, Notre Dame is Jamiat, our mother. You know, it's a Catholic university. They revere uh, Sayyidina Maryam, so is, you know, is, uh, Jesus' mother. But then I was in the Middle East recently, and some people said, you're from Nostradamus. No, no, I don't make any predictions. To the contrary, I, I, I doubt predictors. Uh, and so the, the discourse in Islam should turn to the ethical, because this apparatus of a fiqh, except for the ibadat, is clearly anachronistic. Anachronism is the order of the day. And that anachronism is the problem. And therefore, what, we, what, I, what I keep on going on and talking about is the, is the spirituality of the imagination, where people like Ibn Arabi can talk about and says, you know, my heart is a receptacle for every form. It is a, a pasture for gazelles. It is the temple for the idolater. It is the, the uh, monastery for the monks, it's the pages of the Torah. It's, uh, it's the scrolls of the Quran. My religion is a religion of love, wherever its caravan takes me. For love is my faith, and love is my religion. That's what Ibn Arabi says. Oh, here is what Ibn Arabi on this poem talks about the whole question of, you know, he talks about these birds who are circumambulating the Kaaba. And these birds can also be the pilgrims circumambulating the Kaaba, doing the tawaf. And he says that, you know, these birds are doing that, and he's talking about the pilgrim, but he uses the image of the bird. And these pilgrims want to, want to touch my legs, they want to kiss with the stone. And he talks about how the prophet then kisses the stone. And yet that prophet can then announce. And the reason says, it doesn't make sense to walk around the Kaaba. But it's in, it, because it's a ritual, it's not, about, it's not about logic, it's a ritual. Human beings, we're also products of ritual about certain behaviors that connect us to the transcendent, right? But then that prophet announces, فَأَيْنَ مَقَامُ الْبَيْتِ مِنْ قَدْرِ insani. How could he ever compare the sacred house to the value of a human being? It is this that we need to it's when our, we do not read literature, when we do not read poetry, when we do not understand Islamic spirituality and Sufism and read Rumi, where the soul can be, can be refined, that's where civility happens. Then you have uncivil behavior. That's where it's through reading material, living those kinds of lives in which there's compassion and love that we can only have a possibility of a better politics and a better world. And this is not, this is not the realist here in the room going to tell me, but a power is about, you know, about having strength and so on. Yes, you need to have power to insulate yourself against all enemies that want to destroy your, 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 the possibilities. But today, you know, having big militaries are actually not really helpful. Because the, the destruction of today can happen with somebody bringing a small toxin into the city of Kuala Lumpur and destroying millions. And it can go undetected. It's a very dangerous world in which you're living. But we ought to, what, what is the goal, and want to end off where I started, that we need to have strategies and mechanisms to reduce the number of angry people in the world, to reduce the number of people who are disenfranchised, to reduce the number of people who are living undignified lives. And it doesn't matter if you don't have it in your neighborhood, then Bangladesh has it. If you don't have it in Bangladesh, then people in, in Korea have it. If you don't have it in Sub-Saharan Africa, it has it. And so therefore, we have to think like a collective. Because the unhappy Muslim in Syria is going to destroy your, your country in one way or the other. Or the angry Muslim in Iraq, or the angry Muslim in Afghanistan, who is now complete desperados, completely desperate, going to do irresponsible things. And therefore, the responsible people need to do something. When good people do nothing, everything goes, goes, to, go, goes to waste. And that's the model of the hadith. And that's how we think about uh, the question of civilization, is because of the lack of civility. I thank you for your patience, and I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you very much.